Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, or depending where you are. Uh, I have a, a colleague I talk to frequently in Australia, and I always have to remember to say uh, good evening when it's my morning, and so on. <clears throat> uh, apparently, someone just typed into the chat that there won't be a host introducing this, this talk. So I'm just going to start. Uh, so welcome to this. Uh, Scott Sievright asked me to, to give this talk. And it's about, uh, and please, uh, um, please have a little patience because uh, since there doesn't appear to be a, another host, um, I have to pay attention to the chat and admit people when they enter the waiting room. So you might see me sometimes pause and look puzzled. <laughs> <laughs> That's because I'm doing that. <laughs> so anyway, uh, let's talk about how Agile has changed. So you might wonder, well, who is this guy? My name's Cliff Berg. Uh, you can tell I have gray hair. I, when the Agile movement started around 20, 20, 2000, uh, 2001, 1999, 1993, depending on where you make the starting point. Um, in 2000, I was 20 years into my career. And in, in 2000, I was CTO of a company that I had co-founded that by then had grown to about 200 people. And we, we built uh, B2B uh, enterprise class things using Java. Uh, I was uh, an author of some early Java books. I wrote Sun's Enterprise Java book. I wrote the first uh, column on Java in Dr. Dobbs' journal, which was a pretty well-read, um, widely read magazine at the time. Today, we don't have magazines anymore. <laughs> Amazing how things have changed. And uh, well, we do, but uh, they've really diminished. And uh, I was very interested in Agile because, you know, when, uh, to me, I kind of became aware of Agile per se, although I was extreme programming. Uh, in 1999, Kent Buck's book came out and, and one of my architects told his manager about it and he told me. <clears throat> and so I told them to try it. So, um, so we became an, an XP company. And uh, yeah, that was a, a learning journey for me, but to me, Agile was like a breath of fresh air because it was really the 1990s that kind of was the, the methodology craze. Before the 1990s, people didn't use frameworks or methodologies for building software. They didn't. What, what you had to do was find a project manager who knew what they were doing and was a good leader. And that was hard. <clears throat> it was like finding a good artist. Uh, and so you didn't know what you were going to get. The project could fail or it could be very successful, depending on, on who the project leader was. <clears throat> you know, because people have different leadership styles. Some, some people are autocratic. Some people empower others. You know, it was all over the map. And <clears throat> so, you know, but by the late 90s, project management had become this big heavyweight thing. Uh, with phases and, and lots of steps and documents and all that, and it wasn't working. And people in the IT field who had been programming knew that that didn't work, but they weren't in charge. You know, very often it was procurement officers and people who procured projects and structured projects, people who had not actually built things were telling the developers how to do this. And it wasn't working. And the agile movement was like, wait a second, that stuff doesn't work. Let's go back to what used to work. You know, small teams like Frederick Brooks, Brooks wrote about, then the mythical man month, you know, and, you know, have, um, you know, a lot of testing early instead of at the end, you know. And so, um, you know, you can't just also collaborate through documents. You have to have people talking to each other too, you know. So, so that was a breath of fresh air. Um, so anyway, the, to me, the Agile, you know, the emergence of Agile was like, okay, finally, you know, we're getting common sense back. Um, and I ended up writing some books uh, about it. And recently, I came out with a book with uh, six other authors called Agile 2. And we tried to collect together a lot of the, the, what we think is the smarter thinking in the Agile community from the last 10 years, because Agile's really changed. And that's what this talks about. Uh, Jeff Patton wrote a very... Uh, successful book uh, called, um, uh, 
what is it? Is um, I think user story mapping. And he recently, I watched a podcast and right at the end, he says something really intelligent. He says, when people say agile today, they mean something that different from 20 years ago. And it really has changed for most people. Some people are still kind of holding on to the original narrative, which I, you know, I feel and the other agile two authors think was way too simplistic, even though it was kind of breakthrough and that it pushed us back to what, what to common sense, it was too simplistic. And so if you applied it directly, it didn't work because it was too simplistic. Not that it was wrong. It was just, you know, too simplistic, say for a third time, you know, and so Jeff Patton has pointed out, well, people have evolved in their thinking on this and they really have. It's changed a lot. Um, and if you look at what early Agile gave us, it, it broke the stranglehold of the PMI approach, which, which is a good approach for some things. You know, if you're building a skyscraper, you definitely want to use that approach. But for software, it does not work. Um, I can go talk for an hour and why software is different than building a building. <clears throat> and, you know, some of the, the things that, that the Agile movement reminded us of were that, you know, phase software development doesn't really work well. Um, you have to have, unless it depends what you call phase, you mean prototyping phases are very beneficial, but like if you separate into like requirements phase and design phase and implementation phase, that does not work. That absolutely categorically, categorically does not work for software. You know, and the agile movement reminded us of that. Uh, business users often don't know what they want or need. You know, when you're building a building, you have to know up front because you can't undo the foundation, you know, but with software, people often don't know, they can't visualize it. And it's almost impossible to fully design complex software ahead of time. You know, big teams don't work, you know, don't micromanage developers, documents alone are not effective. You have to build quality in, you can't add it later. You know, and so, so the agile movement push these ideas back to the forefront, which was a really good thing. But then these other narratives emerged from within the community. And, and they you know, not only diluted the original ideas, which were really important, but, but a lot of these ideas were wrong. You know, and, you know, like one, one of them is, you know, teams don't need leaders, you know, and today there's a buzzword, your team has to be self-managing. <laughs> I'm sorry, but no, um, you know, teams need to be empowered, you know, and, and they, they need, they need agency and they need to be objective oriented instead of task oriented. They, you know, so, so there's a lot of truth in the, in the idea of self-organization and, and even self-management. But it's not black and white like that. It's not that simple. It, it really comes down to having the right kinds of leadership, which includes leadership that empowers people. Um, and you know, the idea that written communication is not important. So you know, Alistair Coburn's the one who got into the Agile Manifesto, the principle about the best for, form of communication is face-to-face -face communication. Well, no, it's not. It, sometimes it is, but it depends. You know, if you know, if if you have something complex, it very often is more effective to write it down. But you also need to be available for conversation. You need both. You know, effective collaboration is reading, writing, talking, listening, and thinking. If you leave any of those out, you're not going to have effective collaboration. So, you know, the idea that written communication is like people say, I don't read long emails, that's a dysfunction. If someone takes the time to write an email and write their thoughts down. You should read it. You know, they spent the time, even if it's uncomfortable, you should read it. If, if you expect them to listen to you, because maybe they are better at writing and, and reading than listening. If you expect them to sit and listen to you, you should, you should be willing to read what they write. You know, and the idea of the agile team room, everybody sitting together, uh, just Google open plan office and see how how much people like that. They don't like it. Most people, some, some do. Um, and always trust the team, you know, got way distorted 
you know, uh, you, you should trust to a degree, but it's not absolute. You, you have to assess where people are and look at what could go wrong and how severe that might be. And, and so it's about empowerment, not just absolute blanket trust. And so, so a lot of the original ideas got distorted into these bizarre extremes. Um, and it, people who were experienced, you know, they're within the management cohorts of organizations, you had people who, who had power, who didn't really deserve it, who didn't really know what they were doing. But then you also had leaders who, who acquired power because they were very effective. And, and those people often knew that these, uh, these narratives that Agilists were talking about were quite right. They knew it. And, and so it, it diminished the cred credibility of the movement. You know, trust the team. You know, a, a, an effective leader knows that trust is a matter of degree and that you need oversight and you need, you need to, to find out what the issues are and you need to look at who's, who's becoming influential within a team because sometimes it's not the right person. So you can't just step away and say, trust the team. It's, it's more complicated than that. <clears throat> and so, so these narratives that emerged, I think, you know, undermined the agile movement to a large degree. Um, and, and then I think it was around the mid or late 2000s, you started to hear, and I'm remembering this, uh, that the Agile community started talking about culture because it, it was found that, you know, be, because the, the cottage industry, which became a big industry of selling scrum training and XP and scrum coaching, uh, you know, it became all about injecting, you know, put, putting scrum teams in organizations and giving them scrum masters and agile coaches. And that didn't work, you know, by and large, because it didn't, it didn't solve the problem of how does, how do those teams work within the larger ecosystem? And the agile community didn't have an answer for that. It was like, you know, you're, you're scrum, but, oh, if you're not doing scrum exactly, it won't work. Well, actually, it didn't work because the large organization had enterprise uh, services and lots of products, not just one. So you couldn't have every team just doing anything they want because then the products don't work together. You know? and, and so it was a much more complicated problem. And the Agile community started talking about culture and because it rightly observed, well, culture is important, but then it didn't have any answer for what that meant. You know, well, what is culture? Um, and then you started to hear uh, these catchphrases like you must have an agile mindset. And you, we still hear these today and you must change your culture and you must don't do agile, be agile. But you, you don't hear what that means. You know, so what does it mean to have an agile mindset? You know, and then you'll get kind of a blank if you ask someone, you'll get kind of a blank stare, and then you'll get something very different from five different people. You know, so um, actually in my, my company, Agile 2 Academy, we have been working with a culture organization called Human Synergistics that has a very rich culture model to try and tease apart what an Agile culture actually, what that actually means. Um, but, you know, no one was really talking about that back then. And, and then, you know, another dysfunction was that the community, and this is not everybody, everybody's individual. So I'm talking in the aggregate about, and I was a member of the Agile community. So if you blame the Agile community, you're blaming me too, because I, I am and was a member of the Agile community. And the community by and large in the aggregate was not listening, you know? And if, if you criticized anything, it was like, you're an agile doubter or you're not doing it right or something, or it's, it's your problem. It's the customer's problem. Uh, you know, um, you're, you must not be doing it right. And uh, developers really, well, uh, let me hold on that for a second. And the, the results of agile transformation have not been good. And again, you know, the agile community tends to blame the customer. You're not doing it right. It's, you know, managers are bad, you know, they're, they're not agile. And there's some truth in that. But also if people aren't doing it right, well, maybe you're not communicating it right. Or maybe, you, maybe you're missing some things that, that they need to be effective. You know, why is it always their fault? <clears throat> um, there's, I think there's a lot of 
fault to go around uh, with this. And then very recently, there was a post in Slashdot, which is a programmer forum by and large, very widely read. And someone posted, this was early this year, and after 20 years, have we achieved the vision of the Agile Manifesto? And uh, 10, you know, Slashdot lets you upvote re their responses. And the 10 top upvoted responses were all negative, 10 out of 10. And this is how programmers feel about Agile. They don't like it. They don't like it. And you can blame them and you can blame the organizations and, and you can have theories about why that is and is it their fault or is it our fault or what, but it's not working for them. And this is not everybody. There are programmers who love Agile, but I mean, this is what the data is showing us. You know, th there's a lot of discontent with the Agile movement in the pro community of programmers that Agile was created for. <laughs> so something's wrong. Um, and, you know, again, you can have theories about why that is, but let's not spend time in that because it doesn't really help us that much. But then again, it depends who you talk to, you know. Uh, so, um, so let's remember what Jeff Patton said. Jeff Patton said Agile today is very different from what it was 20 years ago, depending on who you talk to. Because, again, some people are still stuck on the original narratives. Other people have moved on. And maybe these, uh, you know, maybe, let me go back, you know, maybe these programmers are, maybe their experience has largely been with kind of the old Agile, you know, and, and so we're seeing a, a lagging indicator of, you know, what didn't work, but maybe, maybe we've learned, maybe we've learned from this and maybe what, what, what people are thinking today, maybe that does work. I think it does. Um, so what is that? And if, if you look at writing, so I look, like to look at the books because you know, it's written down so you can actually compare. And you know, if you look at books that were written in the first 10 years of the Agile movement, they, they, they're very extreme and they have kind of simplistic narratives. You know, trust the team and everybody's equal. And you know, uh, you know, it's all about the team and, and so on. But if you look at books that came out in the second 10 years, they're different than that. Um, you know, if you look at like the book Accelerate by Nicole Forsgren, which is one of the top, it's in the top 100 books in Amazon across all categories. And yet it's an IT book. Uh, it's a brilliant book. She uses statistics. She's a, a PhD statistician. And she looked at outcomes and effectiveness in organizations that use DevOps methods. And there's a whole chapter in that book on leadership and why leadership's important and how the Agile community has not emphasized leadership um, and it should. So she's a member of the Agile community. She's saying, hey, we need to start talking about leadership. Leadership's important. You can't just trust the team. You can't just say self-organized. There's a lot more to it than that. And so that's the message. Learn about leadership. There are thousands of books on leadership start learning about it. It's really important. It's probably the most important thing of all. You know, Mark Schwartz is seat at the table. I worked for him actually uh, some years back. Uh, he was CIO of the immigration service and made massive change there because he came from Silicon Valley and wasn't a bureaucrat and he didn't have patience for all that nonsense. And then um, Turn the Ship Around by David Marquette. Uh, you know, who we quote a couple times in the Agile 2 book. He's a great guy. He was a submarine captain and he empowered his people on the sub. Um, but did he make decisions? Darn right he did. He was the captain. He often had to make decisions and he was accountable and responsible. But he didn't micromanage people. He said, here, here are the objectives. You figure out how to do it and I'm going to look at the outcomes. He, he watched. He looked at outcomes but he didn't tell people how to do it. And he also trained people, he trained people. So he was not only a leader, he was a coach and a mentor and a teacher. You know, good leaders are wear multiple hats at the same time or at different times. And he trained his crew to speak their mind openly, to, to think out loud, instead of just think and then say their final thought, he trained them to think out loud. 
which which is like unheard of in a military context. Um, someone's playing music. Okay. And my uh, control for muting people has gone away. Uh, okay, that my I can't mute my you know Zoom is so weird. You know my the control for I there was a control for muting everybody and now it's gone. <laughs> so whatever. <clears throat> but anyway, so um, and then there's a book I love by Klaus Leopold called Rethinking Agile. I highly recommend that book. It's a book you can read on a weekend. It's a, a short read, it's a very easy read, but he really, and it's non-technical, but he really connects the dots. And it, he, he, what he's saying basically, it's not about the team, it's about the value stream. You know, there's the Agile community has become obsessed with the team, the team, the team, the team, the team. Even though the Agile manifesto starts with the word individuals, somehow the community has turned it into teams. We've forgotten about the individual. Individuals matter. Individuals have careers. They don't want to all be treated the same. But anyway, um, so if, and then there are these other, lots of other books. This is just a tiny sampling. I have a huge library of this stuff in Kindle. I'm sure many of you do too. Uh, you know, there's some books I highly recommend, Leaders in Motion by Marta Wilson, um, who lives not far from me in Virginia. Uh, Daniel Goleman's Focus, Quiet by Susan Cain, and the, my favorite, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, on why people need quiet and isolation to think deeply. Um, you need, collaboration is really important. Without collaboration, we're not going to go anywhere. But you also need quiet thought. You need both. You need both. And the Agile movement has rushed to one end of the, the, the side, one end of that all about collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. And we've trampled on the ability to think deeply. So we need to restore some balance in that. And that's what Agile 2 is about. Agile 2 tries to collect all these ideas and kind of integrate them into a new narrative that doesn't replace the Agile manifesto, but strengthens, it kind of re strengthens the original ideas, elaborates on them because they were too simplistic and reflects all this newer thinking um, that's much more informed and much more nuanced. You know, th these are some of uh, just a tiny sampling of, of the books. And, you know, these books are not about Agile per se, but they're highly relevant. And, you know, that my editor at Pearson once described our Agile community as insular, you know, that people didn't read books that didn't say Agile on the cover. And that's changed a lot. That definitely has changed. Um, but, you know, there's so many other topics that are highly relevant, like leadership's one, um, you know, cognitive psychology, uh, behavioral psychology. My wife's a behaviorist. She's a, a behavioral therapist. And, you know, her approach is so different from the agile community. Uh, <clears throat> so, you know, we need to learn about those things and organization design and there's a lot. Um, product design. Uh, the Agile community is very aware of the need for product design, but you know, product design got kind of displaced in the early days of Agile. It, it, it was a mature field, but it wasn't very Agile. <clears throat> but it basically, because it wasn't Agile, it got chopped out. And so ag the Agile community, many Agile teams have tried to reintroduce it by inserting UX people, but that's not enough. You need product design teams. These people are experts and they work deeply and they're very thorough and they, they know how to work with users. And, you know, you need product design teams and product design leaders, and they need to work collaboratively through some process with development teams on an ongoing basis. You can't just have a product owner who magically knows everything. You have to have product design. Um, and so, you know, these new ideas are much more effective are much more effective. Uh, and Agile 2 tries to collect them all and integrate and add some things like, like data is another thing that got chopped out. You know, organizations used to have data architects, but that wasn't Agile, it really wasn't. You know, teams were always waiting for the new, art, new data model. That's not a non-starter today. But instead of fixing that, they got rid of it. You know, they removed data architecture from the flow. And we need to bring it back, but in an Agile way. 
And so there's a challenge. What does that look like? Well, we need to stand up to the challenge and figure that out. You know, there are a lot of approaches that I've seen that work, but you know, it's a, it, you know, there's one no one way. Um, you know, we need to include data. The, the the symptom today is that agile teams create microservices that that pump historical data, pump events into a data lake that machine learning teams cannot make use of because the data is not documented anymore. You know, there's no model in a lot of organizations. Uh, and it's, it's a travesty. Um, all that information being unusable. I have a colleague, a machine learning expert, his mathematician, he quit, his, uh, quit a job because at a Fortune 10 company, because the data lake was unusable. <clears throat> uh, so we need to figure out what agile data means. Um, now the Agile 2 team, we launched it during the pandemic. It's a global team. And we, we created a list of the kinds of skills we wanted on that team and recruited people with those skills. And they were all had to have a lot of experience. They had to be people who are not deeply invested in the status quo. So you won't see any famous names here by design because we didn't want people who like had been selling scrum training or something like that. Not that that's bad, but we wanted people who were not invested in the current paradigm. Um, okay, oops. Now, so you might ask, you know, well, okay, there are all these new books and there's new thinking about Agile, but what is it really? You know, can you summarize how it's different from the, what we call the classic Agile? And th that's a deep topic and that's what Agile 2 is all about. You know, Agile 2 is not a little manifesto. It's a treatise. Um, it's, there's a lot there. And it, it, we say explicitly on the Agile 2 site in multiple places that it's not intended to be some kind of complete, complete thing. You know, we, we say several times, read other stuff. These are just what we think, but read other stuff too. You know, it, this, this is complex stuff. You cannot, sum, you cannot describe it all in a few bumper sticker maxims. You know, a uh, bunch of, you know, four, four statements or something. This is about human behavior and how people work together to create big complicated things. Um, and you cannot, some bumper sticker maxims won't cut it. So Agile 2 is, is very rich and it includes, if you go to the site, it includes all the thinking that went into the, the principles and the principles are intended to be reminders, not rules. Um, every principle has lots of cases in which it wouldn't apply. <clears throat> but if you actually compare, try and kind of roll up and, and what's really the difference? Well, classic agile was simplistic and that, for example, it said teams should self-organize. It didn't actually say that. It got it's how it got interpreted. What it really said is the best, you get the best results from self-organizing teams. It didn't say every team can self-organize or should. It didn't say that, <laughs> but that's often how it's interpreted. Um, but in Agile 2, you know, Agile 2 explicitly acknowledges that self-organizing self is a very worthy thing to try to attain. But the way you get there, and, and what's even more important is having positive forms of leadership. And there's a lot of content on what, what we think that looks like, positive forms of leadership. Um, and it depends. And there are many, you, in order for a, an endeavor to be successful, you need not one, you know, leadership, leader is not a person. It, it's, it's a mode, it's an activity, it's, it's, it's something that happens. And it doesn't all have to have happen from one person. And it can happen from people who are designated. It can also happen from people who aren't designated. Um, it, this leadership has many facets to it. And it depends, always depends. So, so that's the hard problem. That's the wicked problem to solve, the kinds of leadership that are needed in each situation. Uh, at classic Agile was, you know, all communication is faced, should be face-to-face. Because it actually says that. It says the best form of communication is face-to-face. -face. It says that. That's not right. 
um, that's an extreme. It's, it's fundamentally a good idea, but it really should be written as face-to-face -face communication is important, not that it's the best, it's important. And, you know, Agile 2 has a lot of content that goes into neurodiversity and how people collaborate well and how people are different. Some people are writers and some people are talkers, you know, and depending on the issue, you might need a mix of activities over time to converge on, on something. Um, and, you know, classic Agile became all about the team. Well, what if you're a large organization that has lots of products? And each product has many teams and the products share components. So that's a, a complicated situation that we have to deal with. That's the real world. And so this, this single minded focus on the team is not sufficient. The team is an important construct, but it's not sufficient. We need to think beyond the team. Um, the product owner does not know how the product is built. You know, so that, you know, Classic Agile doesn't actually say that, but that's kind of the attitude. The attitude in the community tends to be, and again, everybody's different, but the attitude tends to be the product owner is just a business person. They only need to understand um, you know, what the features need to be, and then the development team will build that. It's kind of like an order take or like a feature mill. Like, okay, I wanted the product to do these things. You figure out how to do it and make that happen. But that doesn't really work today. You know, today in, in organizations that, that operate their business on a technology platform, everybody needs to understand that value stream at to some level. You know, you don't need everybody to be an expert, but they all need to understand to some level. Otherwise they can't have effective conversations about how to make things better because they're trade-offs. So, you, you know, the business people do need to understand how things are delivered. They do. Uh, and if you look at successful platform organizations like SpaceX builds hardware, but they, they have a technology platform, their rockets are a technology platform. Their CEO knows how those rockets work and how they're built. And if you look at Amazon, Jeff Bezos, you know, for all his faults, you know, I'm not a big fan personally, but for all his faults, he knows how their stuff works. Um, and there's a lot of evidence of that <clears throat> and because it all matters. You know, how you build the product today is as important as what you build because how you build it affects your quality. It affects your, your agility. So you need, you, need to, you need to know how it's built. Um, experimentation and trust the team. Well, that's too simplistic. You know, experimentation is really important, but it's not an absolute. You know, what if, uh, you know, what if you're experimenting, again, I'll use the example of rockets because it, it really highlights this, or airplanes. What if you're experimenting and people die? So, you know, experimentation needs to be shifted left. And depending on the level of risk involved, it might need to be shifted farther left or less far. You know, so Facebook had a big failure the other day. They apparently aren't that concerned with risk because lives don't depend on their platform. But um, you know, if if the risk is higher, you need to shift the experimentation farther left. It's a balance. <clears throat> it's not an absolute. Uh, Okay, I'm going to move on here, but you know, no team roles, you know, but actually you do need team roles, but they need to be flexible and fluid. And sometimes you have experts and experts want to stay experts and you need to use them in an agile way and figure out what that looks like. It's not that everybody should be fungible. Um, although fungibility is good. It's, it's something to strive for and data and security and product design. You know, those are things that agile Two tries to bring back into the standard narratives uh, around, around Agile. So let's take, let's take just four of these. Uh, and let's look at like just those four, um, you know, just so we don't spend so much time uh, on this. Now, if you look at classic Agile, you know, teams self-organize without interference. And I just have to tell you, I've been on self-organizing teams many times in my career. 
quite a few times. Every single time, it was an awful experience. And maybe I was unlucky, but that has been my experience. I have never had a good experience on a self-organizing team because what has always happened is someone took over. And it, it, in each of the, those cases, it was not someone who was a good leader. It was someone who was persuasive and vocal and aggressive um, and uh, political. <clears throat> so I personally, I'm sure many people do have good experiences with self-organizing teams. Um, so self-organization really, you know, when the Agile Manifesto was written, I remember that time. And, you know, there was frustration around bad bosses. I myself had some bad bosses. And it was, you know, I think the self-organization came from leave us alone. You know, we're tired of bad bosses. And that resonates with me. But just getting rid of bosses doesn't solve the problem. It replaces one problem with another. <clears throat> so we need to be smarter. And uh, what we need to realize is that there's no shortcut, that it's about types of leadership. And we need to understand leadership better. Everybody needs to understand leadership and the different forms it can take. Leadership isn't bossing. Leadership is having influence. It's, it's persuading people. It's sometimes making decisions, either for yourself or that maybe affect other people. Maybe your decision-making authority is on certain issues, like maybe you're a tech lead, but that doesn't mean you're autocratic. A, a good tech lead will be inquisitive and say, what, do you, what does everybody else think? What about this idea? What do you think? Do you think, that, can you find any holes in this? Oh, that's a good idea too. I didn't think of that. Let's think that through. So that's dialectic leadership. It's Socratic. Um, servant leadership is very much a form of leadership. If you read Greenleaf's original paper about servant leadership, it very much was about leadership where you know, people followed the leader. They followed the leader because the leader showed that the leader had the team's interests in mind. You know, so, you know, um, so the leadership is a complex topic. And if you look at books that have been written in the last 10 years in the Agile community, they reflect that thinking. They don't reflect the everybody is self-organized narrative. They reflect a nuanced, sophisticated view of, of transformational leadership and the kinds of leadership that is needed to have success. You know, classic Agile, you know, stressed face-to-face -face communication, but it, that got taken to an extreme. And, uh, you know, collaboration is not an event. It's a process that happens over time. And, you know, for, for simple things, if you want to find out like, hey, what's the data type of the customer ID field, just ask someone. But although you'll disturb them, they might be thinking when you ask them, now you've shattered their thinking. <clears throat> but, uh, but, you know, just, just a face. Okay. Can someone, uh, someone is not on mute and is making a lot of noise. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so, you know, collaboration is a process. And depending on what the issue is and who is involved and how they tend to collaborate, because uh, like scientists tend to write more than talk. It's just the culture, you know? So depending on who's involved, um, you know, you might need to orchestrate the collaboration differently. Someone, you know, very often it's helpful to have someone orchestrate it, like to be suggesting, well, what if, what if we all like spend a day and write our thoughts down and share that? And some people will do that happily and some won't because some people don't like writing and that's okay. But then get together and share and people should read what others write. They should make an effort and then talk it through. But by then you know what people are already thinking and you can focus on the areas of confusion or disagreement. So it depends, it depends, you know, it's an art. Facilitating and orchestrating collaboration is an art. And it, it's not just a simple thing of, oh, every, everybody get together and talk and talk. That is not effective in, for many things. 
Um, it is for some things, but not for everything. Uh, you know, classic agile was was hyper focused on the team, and you know the idea of a feature team that a team can do everything, which is a really powerful situation if they can. But today's stacks, number one, today's stacks are too deep. I myself have worked in stacks, so well, the deepest I've encountered was was uh, embedded code running on machines that sent messages over the internet to a gateway. There's millions of messages per second coming from all the machines. And um, then being, being sucked into Hadoop and Apache Spark pipelines for processing, which th then data got pushed into various data marks and, and message stores. And then there were processes for extracting that that fed other data marks. And then ultimately there were web portals, several web portals for different market segments um, that pulled that into dashboards that customers could see. And there were, uh, you know, the embedded code was written in C uh, and the, you know, the messages were uh, actually gRPC messages, uh, not rest. And, um, uh, you know, a lot of Java and then on the UI side, a lot of JavaScript and all, all kinds of different things and different frameworks. No team can work across all that stuff. No team can work across all that stuff. You'd have to be a genius. <clears throat> and there are some, you know, that, that, there are some individuals, but uh, so, you know, for complex things, this hyper-focus on the team it's a nice ideal, but it, you cannot always attain that ideal. You sometimes can, but it might be really hard. You might not be able to attain it. And in organizations today, you very often have microservice teams because that's the preferred paradigm. You want architectural cohesion. So the preferred paradigm for microservices, you know, if it's a core microservice, is to have a small number of teams that own that microservice. It's, it's a component development paradigm, not a feature paradigm. And, and, and because those microservices are used by many products. So you cannot just have people changing them. Um, you have to be very cautious about changing them. <clears throat> so we need to solve that problem. And there are a lot of techniques for helping to solve that. I've written many articles on, on how you can automate uh, integration testing and, and the different techniques for synchronizing changes across products and components and, and so on. Um, you know, feature flags and feature branch builds and there's always many repos involved. So it's a, a hard, hard problem um, and there's no one solution. So we need to understand that it's not so simple. You know, just, oh, just met, let the team do everything. That doesn't always work. <clears throat> uh, and, you know, in classic agile was, um, you know, I already mentioned this, that the product owner was completely focused on features, which itself is a dysfunction because the product owner should be really focused on the product strategy. It should be a product manager, focus on the product strategy and, and how it's going to be successful and thinking at a high level, not thinking about little features. You know, the product mad, the product owner should be saying, we want the product to enable users to do this. Because I've been working with, and, and some of you, maybe some of the leads of our 30 teams have also been working with actual users through the product design team. And so we have a new concept that the users are, came up with themselves and we want to try that. And we think it will be really effective. Um, and, you know, so someone needs to kind of flesh that out and that's business analysts need to work with the technical folks to flesh that out. You, you don't want a, a strategic thinking product manager to be writing stories. <laughs> you know, you know, maybe if you're writing a little website that works, but if you have something that's complicated and big, like, you know, a, a an application suite that a bank uses for their millions of customers, 
<clears throat> probably a product owner writing stories. You know, very often people who are called product owners are actually business analysts. If you have 30 teams for a product and each one has a product owner, they're not really product owners. They're analysts. There's one product owner and they don't have time to spend two hours with every team every day. They would have to be more than 24 hours in the day. <clears throat> so, um, so the model is too simplistic. The product owner model doesn't scale. And, and, product own, and real product managers do need to know how the product is delivered. If you look at a Formula One racing team, there often are hundreds of people. They're not all shown here. Today, it's, you know, it's, it costs hundreds of millions of dollars a year to, for a Formula One team to keep their two cars in the races, which is, happens for uh, half of the year. They spend half the year designing and building and practicing, and then they spend the other half racing. And they're all involved. And even the, the, the people who are funding all that know how the stuff works. Um, so you cannot just focus on just the goal. You have to also understand how it's going to happen. As Jack Welch said, how you're going to win in this business. Um, <clears throat> so just to conclude, uh, you know, Agile 2 is tries to capture the more recent writing from the Agile community because Agile has moved on. It's become smarter and we need to, you know, we need to differentiate and we need to make, get these engineers who had bad experiences to know, hey, look, we have a different approach today. It's changed. And we value what you say. If you had a bad experience, we want to know why. And we don't want to force you all, you know, if you don't want to do a stand-up every day, you don't have to. You get to decide. We're not going to force it on you. We want to know what do you think will work? And then let's try that. And if it, then we'll reflect. And if it doesn't work, we'll try something else. And it, it, there are a lot of things we need to bring back and figure out how to do them in an agile way, like data and product design and um, uh, architecture needs to be agile. You know, but architecture does not emerge. Um, the architecture is always intentional, but it should be tentative. It should be, uh, it, it should be something that people try things and they, they prototype things. They do agile spikes and then they, they evolve their thinking, but it's always intentional. It's not emergent. Um, and, and one size does not fit all. We should be very wary of extremes. You know, like, let's just do this. No, usually you have to do a mix of things. Any extreme is always a big red flag. <clears throat> My advice is to embrace the recent writing about Agile. The recent writing, a lot of it is really smart. Uh, I mentioned a couple of books, there are tons of them. And trust your intuition. You know, when, when the Agile Manifesto came out, it resonated. But I also knew that the message in it were too simplistic. And I think the authors of it knew that too. But they were just, they had a skiing weekend and they were just trying to write down, hey, let's remember this stuff. And they didn't spend a lot of time on it. It's, these issues are more complex than what they wrote down. And, you know, but it, it, there's, there's truth in them. In the original Agile Manifesto, there's truth in those ideas. It's just not so simple. And, and we need to trust our intuition. A lot of it is common sense. And what can you do? Well, learn about Agile 2 and learn, read these other books too. Don't just read Agile 2. And identify ways that you've already been using these more sophisticated ideas. And start to speak in terms of like the new Agile so that people are aware Agile has changed. That's an important thing, that Agile has changed. People need to know that. So they don't dismiss it based on something they experienced many years ago. And start incorporating some of the, these ideas into your own training, maturity models, and your own practices. Um, and my own company, Agile 2 Academy, is developing some training tools, free training tools, to help people to teach about these things. Uh, and so this is still a work in progress, but we actually have 
have some courses for organizations to use. There's no certification and uh, there's no plan to create any kind of certification. Um, some people have accused us of that and it's nonsense. Uh, I'm very much against the cheap certification mill that, that we all know about. Um, but we're creating some learning materials to help, help people to create their own training uh, about this stuff. And there's more info if you go to Agile, if you go to agile2.net, which is, was the uh, effort created by 15 people, completely nonprofit. You can actually buy a t-shirt there, but it wasn't possible to, to not make any profit on the t-shirt sale. The provider didn't allow that, but they allowed you to donate all the profit to a cause. So we set it up so that $2.02 for each t-shirt gets donated to an animal rescue cause. Um, so there's no money that we make on it. Um, and Agile 2 Academy is my company, which we formed not too long ago as a separate thing. And uh, we do help hope to make money there helping companies with these newer ideas. But again, it's not a certification mill. It's just trying to actually use this stuff. Organizations need help. And we actually, I mentioned, we've partnered with Human Synergistics to try and answer the question of what does agile culture actually mean and how can you identify cultural impediments so that you can start to address those too. So if you say you need an agile culture, we actually can say for a given organization what, what that means and help them to work on those things. Um, Anyway, that's my talk. And I hope it's um, I hope it's helpful. Uh, I kind of wish we had had a host to like wrap this up, but um, let me see if there are any questions in the chat. Uh, do we get this recording? I, it was re it is recorded, but I don't know. Presumably, the link to it will be posted later. Uh, so I don't see any. Any questions in the chat? Does anybody have any? Um, you can unmute yourself if anybody has a, a, something they'd like to share or a question. Leif, I would like to, to ask a question if possible. Sure. Please. Um, Simona from, uh, from Romania. Hi, hi Simona. Uh, thank you for the ideas. I was, I was really thinking uh, on, on the idea of, to incorporate these agile to ideas into our agile trainings and uh, uh, coaching. So thank you very much. I wanted to ask you, what do you think about uh, discipline agile? If you heard about them and what do you think about it? Yeah, you're talking about um, that, uh, Scott Ambler's you yeah. know, the PMI, yeah. Scott. So I've known Scott Ambler for a long time. I've co-authored articles with him. And, uh, you know, I was, when he was working on that, I was very much, he actually copied a diagram. I, in a, yeah. <laughs> he wrote a forward in one of my books and the book had a, a hand-drawn picture in it. And he, he reproduced that picture via a photo on the, that, on the dad book. <laughs> and so I'm like, okay. <laughs> but um, anyway, it was a sailboat picture. Um, but, you know, I, I feel that uh, Scott Ambler has had a mature view of Agile from the beginning. That's why I actually reached out to him around 2003 or so. And I, I think that, that dad or DA, Discipline Agile, what I like about it is that it doesn't say do this and do that. It, it's like a menu of things to consider. And that's how I think we should use frameworks. You know, all these frameworks have good ideas. Like I, in, in SAFE, I like the lean portfolio model. I would never use it exactly that way. You can't use these things exactly because you always have to adjust things. You should never use a framework as a template. You should use it as an idea and then figure out how you would do, use that idea in your situation because it's always more complicated. Um, but I, I like a lot of the, the things in Discipline Agile. I like that it's you know just a collection of ideas, so I I'm very supportive of that. I, I 
I recently I went to the site and it seemed like they were starting to make the content private, like you had to pay for it um, and get and get get access to it only through training. I'm, don't quote me on that because I'm not sure. I didn't spend a lot of time, but it looked like the content was going away from the public site. Um, uh, they sold the idea somehow to PMI and therefore PMI is now the owner of everything. Right. So it's, it's quite possible. Yeah, and again, there's nothing wrong with, with having a business that makes money from training and providing value, as long as you actually are providing value. You know, if, you know training sometimes can be good. You know, my, my nephew is a certified financial advisor and planner, and he got a certification that took, he studied for a year, and it was a very hard test. It took him two days. The test was two days long. You know, and it was an important test. You know, if, if you're a doctor, you have to go through and take tests and, and get board certified. So, you know, certification is not inherently bad. What's bad is if it's like, like superficial or it's like just memorizing someone's framework, whereas as opposed to learning actual skills. You know, if, if, you know, the, if we were ever to create a certification for Agile 2, which I don't envision that, but it would be about real skills. It would be about, you would have to demonstrate use of leadership techniques and you would have to demonstrate, you know, uh, different modes of collaboration, you know, something like that. It would have to be the real thing. Um, but, you know, there's no plan to do that. But, you know, training, training is, and, you know, it's not bad. It's people should, but it needs to have integrity. It needs to be ethical. Um, you know, I think the ideas should be published so that everybody can read the ideas. But I, I think, you know, if PMI's business model, I think it should focus on adding value, like teaching it or consulting or both or something. But I, I think the ideas themselves should be open. Um, but I, I don't know if they still are, but I know that the ideas in, in Disciplined Agile, I liked a lot of the ideas. Um, they, a lot of them were good ideas. Thank you. Anybody else? Come on. <laughs> Hi, Cliff. Hi. Can you see me? Uh, is this Francisco? Yeah, exactly. Oh. Uh, oh, hi. Sorry, I'm not a native speaker. I uh, recently saw an interview that Javier Garza has made to, uh, a few weeks ago. Javier Garza from Spain. Yes. And okay. uh, I, I really like your, the, the pragmatic view of your approach. And I wonder from sorry uh, is something wrong yeah I, did you I hear my question you. I can see you well but but your voice uh, broke up a little bit maybe try again oh, sorry yes. I was wondering if somebody from the I approach the the original people you with feedback about this agile two thing. Um, I heard about feedback, but what was the first part? Someone from from what? Yeah, from, from the uh, original agile uh, oh. conception. Let's say. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the uh, the seventeen people. So you know, I'd like to point out that some of those were smart people, like Martin Fowler is someone who I have immense respect for. Um, and he himself has challenged a lot of the directions that our Agile community has taken. Um, he, he gave a talk, I had a couple talks. There was one in Australia recently where he begins with, with saying, you know, we should not have like thrown out the technical stuff, you know, because um, that's important too. It, it's not singularly important. It's the product design's important, the, the delivery, technical delivery is important, the business model is important, data is important. It's all important. Um, we can't just focus on, if you just focus on like, 
the, the agile process, you become a silo, which is what we're trying to fight. You know, so, um, uh, you know, the, but, you know, the original manifesto authors were not like brilliant savants. They were just a bunch of people who decided to come together. They'd been writing about this stuff. And there were a lot of people who were left out, um, you know, especially among the, the community of, of women. Uh, there, there, there are people who were prominent and speak and talking a lot about delivery and practices back then among women who were not invited to that. And, you know, so, so I don't see that group as unique or special. You know, I, I think they were smart and they were, they had the right idea at the right time. It was needed. The time had come that the extreme programming kind of ignited the movement because it, it was a book that made it really come to, to the forefront extreme programming explained. And so it was all about XP, XP. And then the Agile Manifesto kind of took the mantle from that. Um, and interestingly, XP and at the Agile Manifesto are kind of very much opposite. You know, XP was about extremes. And the Agile Manifesto, if you read it, the, the values anyway, the, the values are what they came up with at the Snowburn meeting. The principles a few of them hammered the principles out over email later. At Snowbird, they only came up with those four value statements. And those value statements were very balanced. It was about balance. We, va we value all this stuff. We value the stuff on the left more than the right, but we value both of them. You know, so it was about balance, whereas extreme programming was about extremes. So they're very opposite. You know, XP and Agile were opposite. Um, that got lost on a lot of people. They're not the same at all. They're not even similar. Um, there are some similar ideas. There's some intersection, but the philosophy was fundamentally different. I mean, Kent Beck even apologized in the second edition of his book for being too extreme and for being act actually kind of arrogant about it. Um, but, um, you know, we, we didn't invite, you know, so, so you asked if we've heard from them. Um, not really, you know, I, I've been surprised at kind of the silence, uh, the, the, you know, I think they're all busy doing their thing, you know, and I think it resonates, you know, Dave Thomas has been writing about some of these things and speaking about some of these things. Uh, Ron Jeffries has been writing things like don't use agile because it's been corrupted, you know, um, Martin Fowler, uh, um, Alistair Coburn has changed his thinking on a lot of things, and I like him a lot. I, I think he's very much an extrovert, and he kind of pushed the Agile Manifesto into what he wanted it to be. <laughs> you know, uh, you know that thing about face-to-face -face communication, he'd been writing that in his blog for a year before the Agile Manifesto was written. Um, but, uh, you know, we haven't heard from them specifically. I, I have communicated a lot with Ron Jeffries um before this um and so i i know his his thinking but they have not reached out to say anything um they haven't <laughs> anybody else and to be clear you know their work was really important you know, I, I don't want to minimize what they did. What they did, you know, so they weren't genius savants per se as a group. Maybe some of them are, <clears throat> but what they did took courage and it was initiative and it resonated and it was very much needed. Um, you know, I, I wish they had spent more than a weekend on it. You know, I wish they had explained the principle so they wouldn't get misinterpreted as in an extreme way. Um, but you know, it, it was something, it was something noteworthy. And, uh, you know, so that's why, you know, it, you know, I don't hear people and certainly not myself tearing down the agile manifesto. I think, I think it was significant. It was, it's a flawed document, but it was a, a, a good document. And, 
it's something to build on. And, you know, we're, we're trying to build on it. We're not trying to tear down and replace it. We're, you know, we're, we're trying to make a Delta, um, trying to make a, a more nuanced, uh, balanced pivot uh, for Agile um, with the Agile manifesto as a very important contributing uh, component. A anyone else? Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, depending on where you are, I hope you have a good morning or a good evening. And I believe this was recorded, um, but I didn't do the recording. I didn't set this up. <laughs> so I think the way they do it is they post the recording later on the on the Meetup page. Uh, but I'm not really sure. They promise that they will put it on on their YouTube channel. Oh, okay, that's right. They have a the right the um, Access Agile YouTube channel. Let me put it there. Okay. Um, may Agile live long and prosper. You know, I think we need to pivot and keep making it stronger. Um, we need to keep uh, building. Yeah. Have a, have a good day, everybody. Have a good day. Thank you so much, Cliff. My pleasure. Thank you.